Thanks everybody for coming. All right, well, we're a couple of minutes in and there's an awful lot of uh, discussion to have. So let's get us kicked off. Uh, we're gonna open up um, uh, with a welcome message from Randy Pfizer. Randy is a, the executive director and CEO for AGU. And Randy, do you wanna jump in and take it away? Sure, thanks Shelly. And I wanna offer my thanks to everyone uh, for being here. Um, this is a really important conversation discussion and um, your involvement in this is really critical and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm not gonna take a lot of time because um, there is a packed agenda of really rich content um, that I'm keeping you from uh, and I wanna let you get over there. But uh, you know, for AGU, the whole um, discussion, and I know for many of you, the whole discussion around the importance of interoperability and its connection to other research is, really critical. Um, we know that the, the data and the information that our communities um, uh, collect, uh, that they publish in our journals and our other outlets is really incredibly important to the health of our planet, as well as to the health of people. Um, and it's the, the, the ability to exchange that information across different disciplines that is so critically important because of the interconnectedness of all of this. Um, you know, we know the planet impacts human health. Um, meteorology is, is also um, in that mix. Uh, climate change is in there. Um, societal impacts um, are, are in this whole range of issues that need to be resolved. And if data is just data and it's not actually being used to solve problems, then we're really missing a critical element of what we, we need to do with our science. So we invite you as you're here to explore the elements of data sharing with us um, and know that AGU has a strong commitment as we know many of you do as well um, to participating with you in this journey um, and going forward <laughs> to really make it um, much more successful than it has been today. I'm looking Thank for you. Matt Olejewski. So there's and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Shelly. Uh, also, somebody is off mute. The, and the, the company that's taking care of it has stopped working for the last uh, 10 Hi, everybody. 10 We're going to go ahead and mute everybody. It was an uh, just one second. There we go. All right, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Thanks, Shelly. Toss them back to you. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, we uh, we love having meetings where we can open up the floor to anyone. And sometimes that means we just have to watch over muting. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, everyone. I know you're all used to that. Randy, that was fantastic. Um, today, we're going to have three panels. Uh, one of them on the aw uh, awareness around data and software sharing, one on incentives, and one on publishing policy. So our very first panel, um, and Laura, if you could move, uh, go ahead and move our slide on. Great, our very first panel is being gonna be led by Yvette Seeger. Yvette is the executive, uh, the director of science policy at FASEP, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. Uh, and she's been such a great partner in this entire collaboration for the seminar series, along with our other collaborators, which you saw their logos on the first page. Yvette, I'm gonna let you take it away. All right, thank you, Shelly. I was hoping you were going to give me a promotion while my boss is on the line, but uh, oh, no oh, such right. luck. So that is so amazing. I just want <laughs> you to know. <laughs> no, but thank you. Uh, and it is my honor to moderate this first panel about bringing awareness of the aspirations of open and fair digital research projects uh, and um, encourage the culture of sharing within scientific societies. I have 30 minutes to walk you through our four great panelists. So um, I, what I will do is I will go ahead and introduce each of them uh, as they present their, their short set of slides. I think each of them have two to three slides a piece. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have time in the discussion, but uh, if you've participated in these sessions in the past, uh, feel free to put questions or thoughts in the chat and I'll try to collect those for once we get to the discussion part of the session. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Ian Bruno from the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Ian. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so in a very short period of time, I would like to introduce you to IUPAC. Um, 
a, a correction actually because in a way I am involved in the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry as one of a body of 4,000 volunteers drawn from across the um, chemical enterprise. Um, but I think maybe slightly differently um, IUPAC compared to some of the other societies is it is largely a volunteer organisation and so actually my day job is for the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre involved in the stewardship of crystallography data, um, so not actually employed by IUPAC. Um, but very much involved in some of the committees that have been focusing on fair and digital data um, in chemistry. IUPAC has 100 years of experience trying to build global consensus around a common and systematic language for chemistry. And this manifests itself in a number of ways, the way the chemical structures are represented, the way they're named, um, the way we identify them through standard identifiers. Then there are important terminologies, units and symbols that describe chemical concepts and can become very important in points of law sometimes when people may have particular disputes, but also ensuring that there is clear communication um, across sectors. And then finally, those chemical properties themselves, um, perhaps most well known is the periodic table, which is just not just about naming elements, it's also about the atomic weights, it's there at isotopic abundances, but IUPAC also produces other critically evaluated data sets, so it's also a data producer as well. And the community is drawn from across re academic research institutions, but also across industry as well, and it has a focus on policy and education. Moving on to the next slide, there are various activities that IUPAC has been engaging in to raise awareness of FAIR, both within IUPAC, but also beyond. Um, recently, we pulled together a web page which, which kind of describes the work that IUPAC has actually been doing since about the 1990s in terms of providing formats and um, identifiers that support digital chemistry and enable FAIR. Um, and links to that page there. It talks about the standards that are there, um, resources that are available and projects that are aiming to build on that. We also had a FAIR task force, which involved Shelley amongst others as well, to just have a look at FAIR and open data and science and the opportunity there is for IUPAC. And this was very much to raise awareness of, of why it was worth IUPAC and the chemistry community more generally investing time in um, developing FAIR policies and FAIR enablers. Um, this fed into um, discussions at the um, IUPAC General Assembly last year to try and make the case that there was a real clear need to make have more investment in of resources into developing digital chemistry activities, because although we have the beginnings of some of these enablers, there's a lot more that's required. And then on to the next slide. Um, uh, we can't do this alone. Um, we participate in symposia and workshops with other um, players in the um, chemistry community, other societies, other organizations, but also more general ones such as CoData and the RDA. And I just want to highlight here that IUPAC is pleased to be part of a EU funded World Fair project that's looking across global cooperation across um, disciplines when it comes to FAIR. And we see this as the beginning of sort of our opportunities to start broadening out some of the um, broadening out activities that will help raise awareness of FAIR and its importance throughout the digital, uh, throughout the chemistry community um, through recommendations, demonstrators, and some utility services. So, that in a nutshell is my introduction to IUPAC. Thank you, Ian. And I just want to draw the audience's attention to the fact that Chris has. Uh, been kindly adding some key links to the chat um, so you can be sure to to grab those but um, we will move on to our next presenter uh, Gus Minch from the American Astronomical Society so we'll turn it over to Gus. Uh, good morning I hope everyone can hear me okay um, I'm one of the uh, data editors for the uh, journals of the American Astronomical Society so um, I wanted to sort of talk about the ways that we've been trying to bring awareness to open data and open software to the community. Um, and the three ways that we've been doing this uh, include um, my role in the society. There, there are two data editors um, who we've had since 2000 when the trials went digital. Um, through policy changes uh, in terms of software and the future data, to try to change the way some in, in, um, entrenched ways of interacting um, for our authors uh, between 
uh, the journals, the published articles and, and data. Um, can we get to the next slide, please? So one of the primary ways that we do this is through, uh, through the data editor position. So we review about 90% of manuscripts for um, further data content. We look for data that's been hosted or not been um, hosted on you know, non-persistent websites. Uh, we uh, request uh, that authors release their data. Um, uh, and we uh, review how they cite and how they mention the software that they use in their research. And so through, through documentation and through these interactions that we have in the peer review process, um, we aim to um, highlight both the policy changes in the society um, and also best practices. And this doesn't include just data. We also try to, to work on issues of accessibility um, uh, uh, in terms of figures and, 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 and color um, and other um, uh, questions around captioning and things like that. Um, so that's our, our, one of our, our big roles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of policy, um, in 2016, some of our newer editors uh, felt it important to begin with software rather than beginning with data. And so they wrote a new policy that the primary goal was to change um, how uh, the authoring community interacts with the developers of software so that they receive more um, better attribution and credit uh, and so that the material can be indexed and citations um, counted for this material. Um, and we also developed what you could call a software availability statement um, for our articles where authors can list and cite the specific software that they used. Um, in the present, um, we're, uh, I've been tasked with working on a new data policy for the, for the journals to make more explicit some of our under uh, unspoken um, uh, policies and responding to uh, NASA, um, specifically NASA open science initiatives um, and, and asking questions about how we can um, adjust how authors interact uh, with the data and the software. Um, in a more open science way. That's all for me. All right, all right. I was finding the unmute, you know, the challenge. I should know exactly where it is. Thank you, Gus. Um, so an another great overview, but we've got two more. And so I'm going to turn it over to Emily Ame from the British Ecological Society to give us a quick overview about how they brought uh, awareness uh, to open and fair digital research projects in their community. Yeah, thanks very much, Yvette. Um, so yeah, my name is Emily. I'm one of the senior managing editors at the British Ecological Society um, and part of my remit. So I work in the publishing team, but part of my remit is also to kind of look at open data issues um, across ecology. So the BES is a member organization of about 7,000 members from all over the world. So we're not just British. Um, and as well as pub publishing journals, we've got a big grants program, we run regular conferences, we have a big kind of outreach and education program, similar to a lot of societies out there, I guess. Um, and we have seven journals across ecology and evolution, um, including one that publishes interdisciplinary research covering human nature interactions. And that means that as well as the kind of bread and butter is ecology and evolution data, but we do also publish quite a lot of social sciences data. Um, so if you could move us on to the next slide. Um, our current policy on open data just says that data needs to be freely and permanently available at the point of acceptance as a condition of publication. Um, so that means data has got to be free to download without any barriers and without the need to ask anyone or register and data must have some kind of guarantee of permanence like a DOI. So it can't just be on a lab website. Um, and authors can use any kind of re repository that meets that policy. Um, and the data archive needs to allow each result in the published paper to be recreated um, and the analyses reported in the paper to be replicated in full to support the conclusions. So authors are welcome to archive more data than this, but not less. Um, and this policy applies to supporting code as well as data, although for code, we tend to only enforce this for kind of novel code that um, is not kind of for standard analyses. Um, and we currently do checks on this to check that the data are there, but we don't, we aren't able to currently check whether they adhere to fair principles, but more on that in a minute. Um, in terms of kind of raising awareness in the community, um, 
this policy has been in existence for quite a long time and all of our papers need to have a data availability statement, which we publicize quite widely. We run several workshops a year on, on open data and how to make data available for early career researchers. Um, and we also publish several guides on open data and code, um, which I'll put a link in the chat to in a bit. Um, so if you could move us on to the next slide, please. Um, so the current policy works well to an extent compliance is excellent um, and across the ecology community um, I think people are pretty used to open data um, however the quality of that data is is pretty variable and, and the interoperability is, is often poor and I think that's just because we aren't able to check that that adherence to the policies at the moment um, and it means that it's often difficult to kind of put those data sets to get together for meta-analyses um, so if you could move us on to the next slide. So what we want to do about this really is to, you know, work across ecology in collaboration with other societies um, to improve those data standards. So we're currently working on a project in a collaboration with lots of other societies and Wiley um, to update our policies to the, with the aim of improving that quality of archiving, archived data. So we want to ensure that data meet those fair standards and also include clear details of meta, metadata um, as, but as well as kind of that fair metadata I think it's really important particularly in ecology for um, uh, information to be included on how data should be analysed so that that data isn't misused when it's reused in the future. <clears throat> so to do this we really want to make sure that data are available during the peer review process so that editors will kind of assess that going forward. And that's the um, process we're currently going through at the minute to make sure that we can implement that in a sensible way that doesn't involve crazy amounts of work for people and is feasible to, to take forward. And, and we want this to be a community led effort and, and bring the research community with us. Um, so we're doing this across journals so that authors aren't so frightened of, of making that data available at that initial submission stage, I think. Um, so yeah, I think clear communi community consultation is the key to kind of pushing this forward really. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. I know we're, we're getting to, uh, I, I know I'm writing down a bunch of notes and so hopefully all of you are working on uh, questions for when we get to the discussion portion, but we still have one more brief presentation from Doug Schuster from the American Meteorolo Meteorological Society Board on Data Stewardship. So Doug, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks Yvette and thanks to the organizers for including the AMS in today's seminar. Uh, I'm Doug Schuster. Um, I'm, a, I'm a volunteer for the AMS Board on Data Stewardship. I'm the chair of the Board on Data Stewardship. In my day job, I manage a group at the National Center for Atmospheric Research that maintains the research data archives. So I'm coming from the archive perspective as well. So the AMS Board on Data Stewardship um, is an organization with AMS, within AMS, as I mentioned, that's volunteers from the AMS community as well as outside communities, including AGU. Um, with a purpose of really advocating for the application of open science principles in the American Meteorological Society community. Really, we'd like to inform goals, policies, and standard practices in academia, government, nonprofit, and private sectors in the pursuit of open, open science. We have a couple mechanisms that we've leveraged uh, in doing this. Uh, one of those includes development of AMS policy and professional guidance statements. And, um, these are really aspirational statements uh, that reflect the values and norms of the society versus procedural and policy statements that some of the others have put together for publishing. And Mike Friedman will talk about the publishing implications of this a bit later. But I just wanted to go over these statements. So we have a statement named Full Open and Timely Access to Data that was adopted back in 2013 and updated in 2019. And really, Data and open access to data has always been foundational to meteorological and atmospheric and oceanic research. Without sharing of data between nations and institutions, really that research wouldn't be possible. So now what we're really focusing down is drilling down to individual researchers and you know, getting our community in general to share their data. Recently, we've adopted the Software Preservation Stewardship and Reuse Statement. And this complements the data statement 
by really asking our community to share their software in ways they haven't in the past so researchers can replicate the work of one another and more easily really build upon the work of one another. Next slide, please. So we have these tools in place that we need to go out and engage the community to let them know about uh, some of these, some of this information. And really, you know, much of our community doesn't know and is not familiar with what fair data is necessarily. That's not part of their core research. So these are the aspects that we need to get out and engage our community about. So we have, uh, have published these policy statements in the flagship journal for the AMS. That's one way we reach our community. At the annual meeting, we've hosted a data help desk uh, over the past couple of meetings that have been virtual. This was really uh, built by AGU originally, and we uh, piggybacked upon their work and the work of the Earth Science Information Informatics Partners. Uh, we have hosted open science town halls at the AMS annual meeting, as well as open science focused sessions. And we wanna to continue to do that in the future. And then finally this year, we hope to have a few webinars, one or two webinars where we can highlight some of these policy statements we put together as well as the implications for publications. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, I just wanted to highlight that the theme of the 103rd annual meeting that'll be coming up uh, early next year is data driving science informing decisions and enriching humanity. There are a number of focus areas that you can see highlighted on the left of the slide. And this just really emphasizes how foundational, open and accessible and shared data is to our community. And I think the statement, our imperative must be to ensure that data in all its forms and the actions taken based on this data are free of biases and fully accessible um, really highlights that point. So that concludes my slide. So thanks, Yvette. Look Thank forward to you. today's discussion. Yeah, no, this is great. And I just want to give uh, a round of applause to the four panelists in this session for really sticking to time, uh, giving us ample time for discussion and, and Q&A from all of you. Uh, feel free to uh, engage in the chat. Uh, I know we've got a ton of links in there. I do want to make sure that Gus knows that there was a shout out um, and a thank you for reviewing the data and software sec section in your submission. So didn't want that to get buried in the links. But you know, I think there there were some themes that came out to me, um, and and I would love to expand on them while while people put uh, questions in the chat. You you all talked about um like having um policies or standards could you and some of you had timelines on your slides but could you expound a little bit on that process like how how easy was it to engage your communities was it easy to uh get the buy-in or did you feel like you were pushing a very heavy rock up a hill and did you have any unexpected champions as you were working towards uh putting those policies forward so I can speak about the ecology community. I think um, it's pretty binary, actually. People either love sharing data or they're pretty grumpy about it. And so it's important really to get those people who love it and are really on board to champion any policies that you're creating, I think. And that's, that's how you can bring the community along because they're not going to listen necessarily to me as somebody who isn't a researcher. They need... Um, researchers need to hear from each other about why this is a good idea and the fact that it's not as hard as they think it is. I think there's a bit of fear around making data available sometimes, particularly code, if people are not used to code. Um, but I think, yeah, having that kind of clear focus from champions in the community is, is the way forward. And, and we've done that via workshops and webinars and the guides that we give to early career folks. Others want to jump in? We are getting questions in the chat, but I, I don't want to leave a question hanging if you have a really juicy nugget you would like to share. So um, a, a couple of comments, I think they're more from personal observation of the various activities that have been going on, but I think some of the champions that really excite me are the younger career researchers who are coming into this space, seeing these discussions for the first time, and they don't have those sort of years of ingrained practice that maybe make them think, well, why would why, why do I have to change my ways? They're just thinking, well, why wouldn't I do this? And how do I solve the barriers that make this hard and sort of investing time and energy in um, coming up with, with solutions that make things work? 
Um, the other observation I draw on is from the crystallography experience, which is very kind of neighbor, a yeah, close neighbor to, to chemistry, but um, it maybe relates to a question I saw going through in the chat there about um, points from developing data and metadata standards. And I think the success in crystallography is very much down to cross-sector buy-in to adoption of those standards. Um, so beginning with the union who sort of like pulled people together to sort of develop the standards, promote them, but then getting them adopted by publishers, getting them adopted by the people writing the tools that output the data in the first place so the researcher doesn't have to think, and then sort of joined up workflows between repositories and publishers to make it easy for the researcher to do what needs to be done. Um, and then I think, you know, we've tried to continue that cross-sector kind of engagement through some of the more recent chemistry activities, when, particularly when it comes to spectra, getting together, not just the sort of publishers, but also researchers and um, support staff and anyone who might be able to have a role in, in, in actually making this a reality. Doug, I see you unmuted. Did you want to chime in? <laughs> I just say in general, I think the data side has been a little easier to move forward at this point because our community is used to doing that somewhat. Um, for the individual researcher, it's a bit more challenging because projects are diverse. Um, and then software, that's where we had a little bit of pushback because that's a big change in culture and the way of doing things and putting everything available on GitHub. And, you know, people are kind of nervous about having their software out there and others looking at it and do they get scooped you know there's a lot of edge use cases thrown at all these things what about this and that so that's a challenge but i'd echo the early career researchers are big advocates for this we've actually had some senior researchers that are really behind it as well so that that helps out quite a bit yeah i definitely appreciated hearing a couple of you tugged on the thread of early career researchers and how you're engaging them so that was great to hear all right, we do have some questions in the chat, uh, and I will say that Emily is getting the uh, the uh, quote of the session so far with you either love it or you're grumpy uh, when it comes to data sharing. So um, I'll go back to the beginning uh, and this question for all of you, and I know Ian just touched on it a little bit. Are there one or two points you can share in regards to uh, what you learned when creating data or metadata standards to make data more interoperable or reusable? And I know that that was a a theme, you know, you can share it, but it's not always uh, interoperable. So who wants to jump on that one? I mean, I, I'll, I'll jump in just because this is sort of, you know, my role, right, is to sort of transform or transmutate the material that is in the published form or on someone's desk into something that, that appears to be more metadata driven. Those metadata standards that we, we use are, are 22, 25 years old. So it's, it's not as if you know, they, and those were community created. So we have the, the benefit both of an open community in astronomy, but also these open standards that have been around for a long time. But what we're doing is trying to, to sort of teach or aid in the, in, the, in the standardization of this material. And so one of our biggest concerns is uh, our drives for openness that, that would uh, uh, prevent or, or create um, uh, material that's, that's released without uh, standardization or metadata standards, either metadata standardization or format standardization. Um, so the standards are out there, but the question of, of who enforces or, or who, who goes through and, and, and verifies that that material is, uh, uh, is standardized is, is the open question. I think that's a common challenge across fields. Others who want to jump on this question? I'd so, say yeah. we rely upon community repositories to really enforce the standards and the metadata. We don't have the capacity in the society to do that. So the community knows what their standards are, what metadata they're familiar with, and the you know, fair aligned community repositories are the ones that really take care of that for us. So that's what we've had up to now as well, Doug, and we found that it works to an extent, but uh, there is a large amount of data out there that actually doesn't meet those standards. Some repositories are great at doing that curation stage. I'd, I'd give a shout out to Dryad at this point, um, who do a great job of, of data curation. Um, but I think the key for us going forward is that we, we need to have people checking it and that's gonna to have to fall on the journal editors, I think. Um, so, so there's that and I would also say, whatever we can do to give more credit to people who share data well, will do a massive job to, to make this easier. Um, and, and I think that funders can help with that a lot. Um, but the other thing that we can do as journals, I think is, is make sure people are at least asking those data 
um, owners or data curators whether they want to collaborate and whether authorship is appropriate and and um yeah i think there's a lot more to be done there and i love that you you ended on that concept of credit because that was something that came across in all four of your presentations as well is it's just making sure that there is credit available for sharing your data all right i'm going back to the chat i love this group because they make moderating very easy so emily a specific question for you uh, you mentioned you couldn't check the fairness of data. What were the barriers to this? Lack of resources, knowledge, or something else? So at the minute, we ask people to make data available at the point of publication, so at acceptance. Um, and that is checked um, by the editorial office at the minute who don't have either the time or the kind of skills to, to check the ins and outs of that metadata. So that's why I've been talking about kind of bringing that earlier in, in the process and, and having that done by the academic editors. Um, so hopefully both of those checking stages should help a lot. Great. All right. Um, so it uh, looks like a question for all of you. To what extent are these efforts carried over to research and academic institutions by members? To what extent do the organizations try to bring these measures to those institutions? So yeah, what's, what's the communication? And I know we certainly uh, have these discussions at FASIB. What has been your experience of having your members take these ideas back to their home institution uh, to help spread the word? Stumped you. That was a good question, Bob. I think that's a challenging uh, aspect of this, but I think that's really where we're going with the statements that I described for the AMS. We want to empower our members to go back to their institutions and say these reflect the values of our society and our community. We feel that people should be rewarded for sharing data and get credit for that. And you know that's that's where we're going with our mechanisms in terms of how are they fully connecting um, into the institutions. That's hard to measure at this point, I'd say, but that's our goal for sure. So you, you talked about uh, touching the third rail of promotion and tenure possibly, and, and have any of you engaged in, in that topic, uh, you know, trying to have it be a specific criteria or recommendation from your societies or just run, run away whenever you hear promotion and tenure? We put a bit of that in, those, in our statements. Okay. We say people should be credited and rewarded for doing these activities. And then hopefully the members can bring that back and you know preach that to the choir or not the choir but they will be the choir <laughs> convert <laughs> convert them so it's a tough it's very challenging but it's important it's super important like the publishers can do so much but if people aren't rewarded for doing that they're not going to be motivated to do it or they'll find other publishers that have less stringent requirements gus i see you wanting to jump off mute and, and chime in here no doubt what I wanted to say is that that's right. That is a, a big part of the, the policies that we've, we've put forward. And it's kind of a wait and see about the individuals, with the groups that invest in, in specifically in software publication and software release to see if those individuals, I don't, I don't know, I'm not at a level in the society where I can sort of comment on, on, um, on whether we can you know, influence uh, promotion and tenure questions, but that's why we, we create those, those policies. Um, so yeah. All right, we have a global question that I will uh, I will pose now. How is uh, the shifting uh, geopolitical landscape affecting progress, um, or is it even? And and if so, how? I'll give a geopolitical. Uh perspective and i think i'm not sure what's quite behind the question but keeping it to research data i think one thing that is is, is having an impact in chemistry space is the activities of uh, regional initiatives so particularly in germany where there's been a massive investment in nfdi which is a multidisciplinary um, research data infrastructure initiative but then there's nfdi for chem which is specifically focused for chemistry and that's bringing people with time um, to start building the resources and the standards that are necessary to do this, which I think is you know, always been a challenge as to how you fund these standards activities, how you fund these repositories just to get them off the ground. And hopefully that will stretch into sustaining those going forward. So from a geographical point of view, that's certainly having an impact. 
Great, thank you. So um, in the in the chat, um, there uh, touching the third rail of promotion and tenure has has generated some discussion. And knowing that we have about four minutes left, I'm just trying to go through the the comments. But uh, one that jumped out at me was. Um, how there was the um, a rubric is there a rubric for evaluating fair data practices that these committees could possibly use or are there those resources so that if they take your recommendations and give credit for for this work is there a way for evaluating this person shares a lot is really engaged in fair fair data um, do those exist or are those something uh, is that something that your groups are working on I guess the only slightly similar thing is there is a bit of a push towards kind of badges on on articles now that are standardized across across publishers that say this article has appropriately shared data which is, uh, and that makes it kind of easy to see at a glance um at an article level but it it does mean looking at that article level um so yeah there isn't a metric as such for shared data although we do ask certainly as part of our policy that when people um, make their data publicly available, they reference that in the reference list. So hopefully that counts as a citation, but it's it's separating, separating out those data citations from a published article citation. I think that's a difficulty. Others? I would, I would say within our institution that I work at, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, there's been a pivot to look at metrics of data set and software citations more, and an emphasis within our institution. You know, there's there's a project called the Scientific Advancement Modernization Group that's looking at how do we change, you know, promotion critiques for scientists, and this will be a component of that. But currently, it's not a rubric; it's more focusing on citations of digital objects such as data sets and software. So it's really important that the publishers figure out, you know, how to get accurate counts and track this information correctly. I think that's the baseline moving forward. I'm going to take my one minute and, and argue that it's, Doug, you said earlier that you use these repositories, they're responsible for, if they existed, maybe that would work. But, you know, in astronomy, at least, there are big and open access and open release of, of data, but it is false to say that there are community repositories ready to do that kind of thing. And so if you then create a, it's, you know, a, a feedback loop where they have to do it and you have to create DOIs for, you know, their data, and it doesn't, it doesn't really work, right? So there's a lot of ways of citing data and linking to data to make a, a, a research article, you know, more um, connected to all those facilities, but they don't, they don't track citation. They don't track, there's, there's all kinds of ways it falls apart when you try to push on it too hard. So I think we just keep pushing on, on, on certain areas and we keep trying to interlink these things better, but like citation really does, for data really does fall through, um, unfortunately. That's, a, that's the, the takeaway that we have right now. So just thinking about this from an IUPAC perspective and what IUPAC's role here might be, I think it's to um, make the case for why it is important to share data. It's to sponsor and indeed develop the standards and the infrastructure and to help develop those tools that make it possible. So actually there's no reason not to do it. And so, um, you know, maybe don't have to have those rubrics because people are just able to do it and, and, and they see a way of just doing it straight away. Now, of course, you're battling with human nature. I fully appreciate that. But, you know, making it easy, I think, is, is one of the most important things that we can do to enable that culture change that we want to see. Well, that I think that's a great stopping point to transition to the next panel. Um, I want to thank Emily, uh, Doug, Gus, and Ian, who disappeared from the pin. I was just like, where did he go? Um, but I thank you all for the discussion. There were only a couple of questions that I wasn't able to get to, but I encourage uh, the panelists to engage in the chat. Uh, and uh, you know, my take home is data sharing, got to make it easier. So. Um, I will now turn over the moderator role to Julianne Barone uh, from the, the executive director at the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Luckily, I didn't make you work for my federation, Julianne, but uh, I am pleased to pass the baton over to you. Thanks so much, Yvette. Um, as Yvette said, my name is Julianne Barron, and I'm the executive director of FABS. <laughs> um, we are a coalition of 27 scientific societies uh, that come together to advance the sciences um, in these disciplines. 
Um, it's been a real honor to be a part of this collaboration, and I've learned so much over the last year of sessions, and so I just wanted to say a quick thank you um, to Shelley and NSF and all of my colleagues from the Sister Scientific Societies who have worked together on this. Um, and, uh, and I'm really grateful for the invitation to chair this panel today. Um, this panel on providing incentives for sharing in data software, I wanted to mention that in uh, both in the collaboration of this series, but also of our panelists, we think very broadly about the ideas of incentives and many things that were brought up actually in the past panel. Um, we think in addition to uh, credit, um, also removing barriers, but also just sort of um, making sure that people who are engaged in it, recognizing the challenges, the time, the commitment, you know, have the satisfaction of knowing that it helps to advance science. And so uh, um, given all of those different considerations as we think about uh, the incentives. I will uh, introduce the panelists and then ask them to um, pass the baton from one to the next. We will first hear from Frank Krauss, the Executive Director of the Federation of Associations and Societies for Experimental Biology. Um, and then from Cindy Pasca, the Executive Director of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Um, she will be followed by Leah McEwen, uh, the chemistry librarian at Cornell with um, IUPAC, as we heard from Ian. And uh, last, we'll have Brooks Hansen, who's the executive vice president of science at AGU. Um, so, and uh, please do, if you have any questions as the panelists are speaking, please do put them into the chat. Um, and Frank, I'll turn it over to you. I have to move the mouse to the end mute. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with all of you today and, and really echoing uh, Julianne's thanks to, uh, to Shelley and Laura and Brooks and, and everyone that's made this, this series quite uh, an educational and valuable experience for, for hundreds and hundreds of, of individuals um, and certainly dozens and dozens of, of organizations that are gonna, gonna make this, this uh, this work and, and, and facilitate this change. <clears throat> We've heard a lot of, of very complimentary uh, points and discussions from the, the former speakers, and I think we're gonna hear the same things through, through this session. I'll focus my comments a little bit more on that incentives piece, um, since that is what this, this panel is, is about. But uh, about a year or so ago, uh, Yvette and I presented uh, to, to this group as part of this series about a program that FASIB was uh, going to launch or was hoping to launch um, to advance data sharing and reuse. Um, and we have done that and, and made a, a significant multi-million dollar multi-year investment in this space, uh, resulting in a program called DataWorks. And as we investigated this, we saw exactly what, what we've been talking about earlier, right? How do we shift this, this work from one of compliance to culture change, right? Recognizing that you know, uh, data policy statements in the journal are necessary, but not sufficient to, to move this forward. And further recognizing that the large funders requiring data to be shared, such as the NIH data sharing policy that goes into effect in January of 2023, are important ways to, um, to incent, perhaps with a stick, but to incent uh, researchers to, to share their, their data more, more broadly um, are also important, but again, not sufficient to really create the type of culture change uh, that we're looking for in this space. And in particular, in the, the life sciences, where you know, my assessment uh, from working both in the, the physical sciences and now in the life sciences is that you know, the life sciences is behind. Um, when we've heard uh, from AMS and, and chemistry, you'll hear from Brooks, um, they've made quite a bit more progress in regards to, to collaboration and sharing of, of massive uh, data sets. While there have been some successes in the life sciences, um, the Human Genome Project as, as one example, um, they have been relatively uh, limited. So, so our effort is focused on, on helping to accelerate discovery um, and to, to maximize the return on the research investment. Um, there's never enough funding um, available. We're, we advocate all the time for more and more funding. 
um, but there never will be enough funding available for all the great work that scientists want to do. So how do we maximize the value and the impact of the funding that we already have? So the DataWorks program has four different uh, components, as you see below. All of them provide ways to incent uh, the community um, to advance this, this you know, culture of, of data sharing and reuse, uh, whether it's through participation in data salons to ensure that your voice is heard um, in, in terms of your needs, um, what the standards should be to advance this, um, or participation in the DataWorks community to develop data science skills within the, uh, the broader life sciences research community, or the help desk, which is intended to provide resources um, to, uh, to aid uh, those that are trying to make their data more fair or meet the compliance requirements of something like the NIH data sharing policy. And then you'll notice that I skipped the order um, because obviously one of the big incentives, uh, incentive programs uh, that we have is specifically focused on a prize uh, program. For, uh, uh, for data sharing and reuse. Um, I'm gonna change slides, or if I can advance the next slide and talk briefly about a small foray into uh, the prize program area. Uh, we are already rolling out a series of data management plan challenges. These are small, very quickly turning challenges to uh, recognize and reward researchers um, who have exemplary data management plans um, already. Um, and these are $1,000 cash prizes. So they're small, they're more recognition. The goal of this is to build a repository of exemplary example data management plans um, that will end up in that knowledge base in, in, for use by the community so that people have resources to see, well, this is what a good data management plan looks like as they prepare uh, their submissions for, for their grants. However, the prize program um, is intended to be much larger than that. Our goal is a million dollars in annual prizes being awarded um, each year in this area. Um, and I hope we will be announcing uh, our first partnership in that area very soon. <clears throat> um, but these are intended to raise the visibility and the recognition and, and really kind of drive that value in the community of, of just how important this is um, for us to, to share data. And then below that, you see some, some opportunities for you to engage uh, with the DataWorks program, um, including a future salon that does talk about data management plans uh, coming up on May 12th um, and ways to learn more um, through, uh, through your network and, and sharing information about DataWorks. That's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Pasca and I look forward to the discussion. Hi, thank you very much, Frank. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I echo both Frank's thanks and Julianne's thanks for not only being invited to be part of this great panel, but also for being part of, uh, to be, being a collaborator with this wonderful, wonderful program. CSSP works a little slightly differently than, than um, uh, uh, more along the lines of it is a, because of the diversity of our membership, we go across multiple disciplines. We found that advancing science um, collaboratively across disciplines, uh, learning that finding the information gathered in these disciplines in one location allows for a different kind of collective thinking. And it expands exposures to work being done in other sciences that has led to research that might not otherwise have been identified. Um, you know, the, the, one of the, the programs that we are, that our members really look forward to are the frontiers of science. And when they hear about those frontiers of science, they look for opportunities to engage their science programs within that, that new initiative. And when, when the data that comes from one discipline is shared outside of the science of discovery, um, the opportunities to build consensus across those disciplines um, and establish appreciation for those new findings that might then be used uh, from one science to advance other science as well. And that's really one of the great values that CSS pre CSSP brings to that data sharing of information. Um, over time, we've learned that there's a greater recognition for this value to one's own research. And as the community addresses a 
growing concern around trust in science or actually the lack of trust in science, um, that we recognize that sharing this good science is based on strong and proven data and that opportunity has increased as well. And um, it, it's, it, it has also given a greater extensive range of sciences and scientific results that of, of new discoveries. As we all know, good science and, and what Randy talked about when he started this, good science is, is part of what helps resolve global and uh, global threats and provide for the future of our, our world. And the results will improve and grow scientific innovation, which will help the, the broader society. And in addition to the research value added, um, having this data across disciplines aids for advocacy in science, which we all know we want to, you know, is very important to us. And it, um, it's the backbone of supporting the, the advocacy on the broad sciences, not the specific sciences. So knowing what's going on in many areas allows us to do a better job of advocating for fully for science. Um, as a multidisciplinary organization, CSSP members are aware of the value of sharing data and learning from one another, but being a part of this group in this series has expanded the opportunity for them to be part of um, a wider audience that allows for broader views and challenges and more importantly for some new solutions. So finally, CSS is part of the recognition CSSP does through scientific achievements. We have awards that are presented not for a specific science, but for highlighting the ways in which knowledge shared outside of one's own science helps to cultivate a network of multidisciplinary science and technology resources that benefit more than just the one science, they benefit everybody. So I uh, thank you for that. And I will now turn the microphone over to Leah. Thank you very and much. And the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let someone take care of the spotlight. Thanks very much, Cindy. Um, while my slides are being loaded, I will um, echo everyone and, and say thank you for this excellent um, seminar series. The amount of experience and ideas uh, we've been able to share through this is just the beginning. So. Uh, I hope this is one of many conversations to continue with this group and, and others. Um, so I'm coming at this from with my librarian hat on. I'm also um, uh, active in, in IUPAC uh, along with Ian um, Bruno, who was in the earlier panel. Um, but this is, this is, I'm drawing mostly from my librarian experiences here, working directly with researchers at the point that they're managing their data in their laboratories uh, and then preparing it um, for publication in one form or another. Um, and, you know, of all the different types of incentives and, and discussions and, and pains and gains um, that I've had with my researchers in the course of supporting them, but also just in various conferences and, and series like these, these are the three that, that seem to resonate most um, with the, the scientists that I work with. Um, you know, in, for chemistry, um, and actually before I leave this slide, um, this is a great quote from one of our students at Cornell. Uh, when, when someone asked her, you know, what's the most important value you get out of managing your data? She's like, you know, I, yeah, I, I've lost a lot of data because I didn't, I didn't take care of it. Um, you know, so data, I'm, that's a little bit more about data management and not just sharing, but there's a continuum certainly between the management and the sharing, and particularly if we are sharing um, accessible data, machine accessible fair data. So marketable skills, advancing research and improving workflows. Go ahead and next slide. So this is a National Academy of, uh, report that was just posted um, a month or two ago from uh, on chemical engineering new directions. Um, so uh, probably the majority of practicing chemists in the world are in, in, the, in the industrial sector. Um, and in an industrial sector, data are very highly valued. Uh, you know, it's expensive to collect on the one hand and on the other hand, um, the industries are very keen to be optimizing uh, everything about their work, um, they're, they're developing products. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, there's a lot of need to manage their, their in-house data. 
Um, they love to build off of data that's been generated and, and um, derived from uh, external, especially academic research, so they have an understanding of what novel things are happening. Um, so data is, is actually very highly respected in chemical industries, and they've been managing um, their data internally, at least for decades. So there's a lot that we could be learning from that. And I think the marketable skills uh, argument, you know, cannot be um, emphasized enough in terms of what is important about um, supporting researchers and sharing data. So the data becomes shared and available and the researchers um, are more familiar with managing it, handling it, applying it. Um, and data science. So I just grabbed a couple of, of um, quotes from this report. Um, thanks, Chris, for putting the link in if people want to go and, and look, there's a whole tool, a whole, excuse me, chapter on there on tools and emphasis on artificial intelligence, machine learning, modeling, simulation. Those are all really um, high value applications uh, in chemical engineering and probably other uh, sciences as well. Go ahead, next slide. So, um, just that's the last one um, for for chemistry. Uh, that just uh, there's this on the left. You'll see um, you know a study that was done in 2015. Although I think this is probably still similar years later. Is that it, you know uh, chemistry is a very data intensive science. Um, it's a long tail science, so there's a lot of different kinds of chemistry happening in a lot of very small laboratories all over the world, um, but it is a very data intensive science. So it, the culture change is not so much about data as, as about uh, thinking about organizing it um, in, in, as files and sharing that. And actually even you know, the data are reported in the article, so we need to be, the culture shift is from going from data reporting to data sharing in a fair way. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to work further with researchers. And I think others have commented this on the pains gains, um, you know, um, balancing act that a lot of them are facing as they're trying to get their job done. Um, we did a value proposition exercise at one workshop where we had um, data editors and uh, others in chemistry, um, you know, about, about the, the relative challenges. And so the, this panel is asking what can societies do to support, um, to support, um, you know, in the way of incentives to support researchers. I don't know about incentives, but I, I, I wanted to draw on some comments that were um, mentioned earlier. I think Emily in the last panel, she says scientists really need to hear from each other. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity for society. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the Data Works program, those saloons and community venues for bringing people together to, to share. And I think in chemistry, the big value there is to bring um, scientists from the industry to connect with the, the research community, the academic research community about, uh, about how important um, data skills are um, for chemistry in general and, you know, you know, what, and what they can bring to the table if they're developing their data skills. Um, so I, I can emphasize that skill development. The other thing I wanted to call out here is I think there's a lot of roles for multiple stakeholders here. And I, that's another opportunity for societies. Societies are bringing together scientists in these different sectors. Often societies like many of those here have publishing arms. So you're bringing publishers to the table. There's connections with the funders. And there, you know, there's just a lot of, of key roles um, involved in, in, in helping this happen um, to support researchers. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you. I will now hand it over to Brooks Hansen from AGU. Thanks, Brooks. Hello, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. And I'm going to follow up on a lot of what others have said um, and really talk about uh, you know many of many of the talks have led and focused on this culture change challenge, and it is a large challenge. And um, I'm very optimistic that we're well positioned to meet it. It's a lot of work and I think we can build off, I'll close again by saying we can really build off the energy and collaborations that this series have uh, developed. So thanks to NSF, Shelley, and all the participating society leads on organizing this. So uh, this culture change is, is a big challenge. I'd like to quickly think about or imagine some of the culture we're trying to change. And this is this is when we think about science in the 21st century. It's um and, and the the needs for humanity and society in that 
this is, you know, the type of science we need is, and, and that's happening, and that's really important, critical, is interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, convergent, whatever your favorite word is. Um, and that means that there are bigger teams involved. It's international. The teams are diverse and spanning many, many of our societies in one team. The, the science is more complex. It's um, a big data, but not a single big data. It's multiple big data sets that require interoperability. Um, and software. And to use them, it means that they have to be open so that those teams can work on it and so other teams can reproduce it, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that. Um, it's also community engagement and really leveraging their broader impacts. All those interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, convergent, cross-disciplinary science are, are addressing the really important societal challenges and problems for sustainability and our life on the earth and, and going forward. To do that also, we need um, to really address the uh, diversity and inclusivity and equity in science. That's not just to make science better, it's because that makes the communication and the engagement with society much better. And um, we, can't have society, we can't have science increasingly isolated and separate from society. And so that DEI issue is increasingly important. And all of those get back to, I think, which, what Cindy mentioned as well, is improving the trust and integrity of science and all, all that openness Openness, not just in data, but openness in who can participate is really critical. Uh, and open communication is really critical for that trust and integrity in um, science. So those are the culture, that's the culture that I, I believe all of us want and, and know that science needs for the 21st century. And so how do we get there? And one of the challenges is a lot of the structure of how we do science isn't, you know, it's, it's good, but it's not fully aligned with that culture. Um, it's disciplinary, both societies, funding, departments, and the data infrastructure is lacking, but the, the others are in many ways disciplinary and even our cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary societies kind of act in a disciplinary sense. So um, how do we, you know, I think this collaboration, you know, we have 90 people on the call and, and dozens of societies here is, is a great start for, you know, the thing that, that we really need to do is, is start breaking those disciplinary barriers and working and acting together and collaboratively. And I think there's a great opportunity to really work collaboratively on both on messaging and real we'll work together on uh, joint meetings, joint initiatives and so forth to address um, uh, those culture changes uh, that we need. So I think this series is a, um, a great way to start together. And you know what's been great just even today is just listening to all what we're doing kind of individually as an example, um, you know, AGU changed the context just last year around our fellows nomination so that our, you know, in the past we have had community science, communication, DEI awards that are kind of exceptions rather than the rule. So we added to the context to our fellows nominations that includes um, we expect fellows to support DEI, to engage in open science, to engage in communication, to work with communities. Um, many of them were already doing it. It was kind of a don't ask, don't tell policy before. And we want to actually ask and we want to tell all the great things that our, our um, scientific leaders and scientific laureates are, are doing on those other things as well. But it's one thing if AGU does that or a few other societies, but imagine if all of us um, did that collectively and messaged that collectively and communicated that collectively. I think that would start to get at some of the um, challenges we've had with um, tenure and promotion and the rewards and incentive structure and science that feeds into this whole um, culture change of, of that, that are again, not quite aligned with where we want it to go. So I'm really optimistic that what we've done in this series and in a few other collaborations are paving the way for that um, really a bright future for science in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Brooks, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I want to quickly give a plug for the WeShare data site that has come together from this collaboration because there are a lot of resources, particularly about incentives. I think it was the, the March session and there's a couple of ones, um, you know, if you're eager to hear more about incentives. Um, I'm going to ask a question in case we have about five minutes. So if people have a question, maybe be quick and put it in the chat. I'm curious, we talk a lot about data sharing, but I'm curious if anybody, and, and Leah, there was one of your slides that really caught my attention, thinks about data use. One of the things, you know, if they build it, will they come kind of question, you know, and 
I'm curious, um, you know, I've heard some resistance in terms of sometimes every, everybody likes to be invent the new wheel, um, you know, and collect their own data. So I'm, and that might change um, by discipline, but I'm curious if anybody has thought about incentivizing, incentivizing data use. And then a second part of that, I'm just curious if the pandemic had any impact on sort of the importance of being able to use existing data or leverage existing data. You know, I, I know my members really challenged to, to collect um, data during that time. Um, so I don't know if Frank or Leah or anybody sort of wants to speak to that of thinking of the use in addition to um, the sharing. So I can jump in on that. The, the prize program that I referred to will have uh, significant uh, prizes uh, awarded um, both for sharing um, and reuse of data. So successful application, uh, reapplication, reuse of data will definitely be, be highlighted. And again, to, to showcase the value there. And of course, the, the number one you know, barrier uh, to, to data not being reused that is always cited um, by the, the researchers is they can't, they can't trust it. Right, they, they they don't they don't know they don't have enough information about how it was created, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they're hesitant to, to use it. Um, so we need to address that barrier, lower that barrier, um, in order for people to trust the data for for reapplication. So, so Julian, a couple of examples I often give when we think about this. Uh, there, there's so many examples. Sometimes we forget about you know conveying the example. The the two I give are. Uh, weather prediction and the GPS system, which are, are great examples of interoperable data that have trillion dollar benefits to society. And, you know, not every example will have trillion dollar benefits of interoperability and data assimilation in the models and the functional systems, but those do. Another one that comes to mind, you mentioned the pandemic, is the um, wastewater monitoring that's happened um, for COVID. That's, that's really been an early warning signal um, and really helped uh, response and that's a great example of interdisciplinary convergent research. Um, uh, you know that's moved in you know collaboration in some sense between the earth sciences and health sciences of um, of that and and there is actually many more types of interoperable monitoring that we could do um, on pollution pollution control where we're you know there's a lot of that happening but we're not celebrating it so that's a good point and the benefits are huge. Julianne, you mentioned and you you asked a question regarding how the pandemic played a role in, in how all of this, the, the engagement happened. Um, during the pandemic, there was a launching of an international science reserve. And I think that that the community was able to pull together on a on a broader basis. Um, it's a preparedness for um, crises that that occur. Their first one is on wildfires, but because of the you know the, the we'll look for the silver lining that comes along with the pandemic is because of the ability to reach so many more people in a broader context they were able to pull that together did it and and you know and to to start this process but that that's a sharing of information on how to how to respond to crises um and the community the scientific community can be prepared for that so Leah had you uh, wanted to jump in. We have one minute. <laughs> yeah, just really quickly, two things to emphasize there about data reuse. That's an excellent point. So I think there is quite a bit of data reuse happening, but I'll echo Frank and that the, there's a challenge with the citation. And so I think, it, you know, to both, re, you know, incentivize data reuse, but also uh, allow that track back to the generators. And, to, you know, I think that gives them feedback. Your data was reusable. <laughs> you reported it well, and it was accessible, and therefore it was able to be used. So kind of closing that that loop on that. And I think the other thing to, I, I don't know if this is just totally wild and crazy, but as we were sitting here thinking, I'm thinking like data curation needs to be um, acknowledged as well, because I think that's a lot of what happens too, is that data needs a little bit of um, cleaning up before, <laughs> before it can get out, go out in the wild. So if there's a way we could emphasize how important that is. Yeah, absolutely. I would say from my disciplines, we're just working on a standard vocabulary, you know, even before the curation. Um, so there was a question too about can researchers trust the data, and I wanted to make sure that you saw that in the chat, um, which I think is an a, a, an excellent question. 
I am already a minute over and I will be fired from the chairing panels in the future if I don't wrap up. So thank you so much to all of the panelists. I want to go ahead and uh, pass the baton to uh, Zolt Silber, the Director of Publishing for the Ecological Society of America, and he'll lead a conversation on publications. Uh, thank you, everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, third panel installment for our Pinnacle, um, Pinnacle series here. Um, I welcome everyone to this, this portion, which is really focused on what I'm, I'm calling a shift in terms of looking at the ground level of things in, in terms of how things are happening um, you know, with, within the actual publications, uh, what, are, what are happening on guidelines and give you an understanding of sort of you know, where the rubber hits the road and where the challenges are. I wanted to check with Shelly though. Um, Shelly, how are we on time here? What is, what is our time check for this? We are brilliant. We are brilliant on time. Okay, so Carry we, still, on. we still have a good 30 minutes. Yeah, you are solid on 30. Carry okay. on. Just for that, I did a color change on the shirt for you. So. <laughs> so anyway, we'll carry on here. Um, so for the panelists today, um, we have Jay Keston from uh, AAAS Science, um, Michael Friedman from the American Meteorological Society, um, Angie Hunter from the American Chemical Society, and Heather Carlo from the Ecological Society of America. And they'll each have a little bit of different perspectives on sort of what's happening at the ground level. If we could change the slide. Um, I just wanted to take a few notes and sort of give you a sense of sort of what I see, um, and it, it may be pessimistic or optimistic, depending on how you look at it. Um, I think, you know, there definitely has been progress made in terms of data availability statements, and they are a reality that is happening out there. We have greater adoption of open data um, across the industry, um, and the industry, looking at sort of the broad industry in terms of information, publishers, societies, um, there are activities opening, happening with regard to open science. And this is obviously one piece of that. Um, STM had the 2020 data year. Um, you know, different organizations have many different um, activities going on with regard to FAIR. So, I, so, I, so it is a movement. So we can absolutely understand um, how, how this has an important discussion that we need to have. I put a chart on here, which isn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, definitive on, on everything going on. It was some data that I pulled, and it was looking at articles, both in preprint and publication, um, that were available in the Medix, our Medix preprint server. And, um, and the interesting point on this is if you look at the orange and green bars, orange being closed data and green being the open data, what you still see is there's still a significant amount of closed data. So that is data that has to be requested from the author or isn't available because of privacy concerns or various other. Now this is medicine, so there may be factors going on in medicine that obviously would make data closed, but what it, what it does show you, there's still a significant amount of that. And so, so that's something we have to have a, a sort of a, a check on and say, okay, well, how far we have, have we gotten? And maybe we need to do more in, sort of in terms of understanding that. But when you look at it from the standpoint of, well, what's happening at the ground level, um, what we're seeing at least in the ESA and others may have seen the same thing is that uh, there is still great author confusion in terms of what this all means, how do they comply with it? What do the, what do the uh, availability statements mean? There's lack of use by authors of availability statements. We still see a great amount of that. The openness of data is, is still a question mark is how available it is it and and some authors still are confused in terms of you know making it available and then there's a wide variety of, wide variety of adoption of the standards so what i mean by that is if if you looked at um and i did a little bit of a scan of different uh publishers um you'll hear different language going on so if you looked at nature they'll they'll say that authors are required to make materials and data and code available promptly and available to readers without undue quality. Well, so what's promptly? So you know, now we have the term promptly sitting around. Then if you look at Elsevier and their and their data linking uh, policy, and they have a they have a data journal, they're saying if you have made your research data available, so there's an if in there. So that's not even an implication that you have the data available. And then if you look at Taylor and Francis and their 
and their data availability statements, they have 12 different templates for data availability statements that to an author would be absolutely confusing from everything from public domain to open data to non-data to requested data. So it's it's a it's a landmine in, in some ways, or land sort of a minefield to some authors in sort of working through this. So it's something to think about. But I just that's sort of my intro to this. I wanted to pass this on then uh, through the group. And Jake, I'll pass the baton to you and you can sort of move on from the slides. Right, great, thanks. Um, so this, I, I just put the link in the chat to um, where this came from. Um, I, I did an analysis back in um, 2021 of all of the papers that science published in 2020 and which of those papers made use of which type of repository. Um, the advantage of working at science is that there's few enough papers we published that it was feasible for one person to do this. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that because you're only looking at between seven and 800 papers, it's not clear how broadly indicative this is of what everybody is doing. But again, it's a useful snapshot because we're a multidisciplinary journal, so you can sort of compare across fields. And so you can see that um, a lot of authors used Zenodo, um, I think, because it's free and it's easy. Similarly, um, a fair number of authors used institutional repositories, and then you have these um, extremely well-established legacy repositories um, where, where Ian works, the CCDC, the Protein Data Bank, and um, all of the GenBank and, and genomic spin-offs of uh, those, those um, NIH-run genetics and genomics repositories. So if we go to the next slide, um, can we, yeah. So you can see a few takeaways from that analysis. Um, the first one is, again, as I said, you know, um, crystallographic and genomic repositories are mature and we and a number of other journals mandate them. We sort of say, you know, if you have crystal structures, then you must put your data in one of these repositories. And so not surprisingly, they get used a lot. Um, but beyond that, we, we have not tried to mandate um, which repository authors use because we don't think that there is yet the kind of community consensus that there has been around um, the genetics or crystallography databases. So then the, the challenge becomes how can authors be persuaded of the value of field specific over general repositories. Um, there's an element of you sort of get out what you put in. And so I think it would be much more useful for everybody in the aggregate if all of the repositories were like CCDC, where there's a great user interface and everything is cross-referenced and you can search by various different, different types of parameters. But in reality, if you're the author and you're in a hurry, it's much easier to just say, okay, well, you know, I have everything in an Excel spreadsheet and I'm just going to toss it into Zenodo. And so what we can do to make progress on that particular issue, I think, is something that we have to focus on. Um, again, without losing sight of the fact that going from, you know, you need to email the author to everything is now on Zenodo, even if it's a little hard to navigate, is, is an outstanding accomplishment. And, and I think to have done all of that across so many different disciplines in the space of about three years, I think I, I feel tremendously proud and gratified by, by how much so many people worked to make that happen. Um, and again, you know, there's also a challenge of which type of data must be archived. So, you know, is it just what's under the figures or, um, you know, do you need to back up from what might have been averaged and, and so on. And um, then our second biggest challenge, I would say, is dealing with third party constraints. Um, this is a little frustrating because, you know, if someone is publishing um, often a, an environmental science paper where they got, um, you know, for instance, uh, waste type of data from various different municipal sources, then, you know, due to the agreements that they made with those sources, they can tell all of the readers how to go and, and get the data from each of them again, but can't just post the whole data set um, for readers to go look at. And so, you know, again, that's, that's something that we continue to navigate. So go to the next slide. Um, this is, uh, just um, I repurposed these slides from a webinar that I gave with Shelly last year, and she asked us all to implement this traffic light um, color code, where green is what we've done, yellow is what we're doing, and red is what we haven't really done yet. 
And so um, for science, um, we now no longer let people embargo data after publication. We mandate data citation. Um, we um, have editors um, on our staff who are very knowledgeable and attuned to trying to help authors deposit data if they run into trouble. We mandate data availability statements and we mandate data sharing. Um, so it's not a question of prompt or otherwise. We, we say, you know, it has to be in an open repository or in the supplement um, by the time of publication. Um, go on to the next slide. Um, this is the sort of in progress slide. So, you know, as I said earlier, definition of data, um, you know, when, it, when do you want to get what hasn't been averaged yet? That, that's really a question, I think, for individual communities to work out. And we're trying very actively to engage with various of the disciplinary societies, um, like ACS, you'll hear from Angie later, to help figure that out. Um, definition of exceptions, you know, again, um, when are you in a situation where readers have to go and negotiate agreements the way the original authors did? Um, data formats and standards, um, again, you know, that's a question that, that we really need to work hard with repositories on. And similarly, data repositories, um, which one to pick? We try to be relatively agnostic about this um, because it's still early days and, and um, we're not certain how things are gonna proceed, but we do want to maintain close contact and have continuing conversations with the various repositories to um, make everything work the best for everybody. And finally, supplementary materials. We do sometimes still have authors who say, well, I just want everything you know, in the journal supplement, but um, we're, we're pushing them very hard toward repositories, which again, will be easier when, when it's easier to um, push toward uh, specific field repositories. Um, and the last one, this is, um, last slide is, is, can we switch slides? This is um, the, the red, which we will do someday, but haven't really done that much of yet. Um, data and software licensing, we don't yet offer guidance. Peer review of data, um, we do this on a sort of as needed basis, but I think um, you know, we would really like to partner with one or more repositories so that this is more seamless. You know, upon submission, authors are directed to deposit their data in a way that referees can access it um, anonymously. And finally, data management plans. We don't really collaborate with funders at this point, but um, you know, it's something that we follow very closely so that um, ultimately, hopefully, the, the question of whether authors are complying with the data management plan that they laid out will be easier to gauge. And that was all I had. Thanks so much. I guess um, this up, I'm next. So um, I'm Mike Friedman from uh, the American Meteorological Society. Um, thanks, Jake, for going over those specific things. Um, you know, we're in a generally the same situation, um, but I'm going to take a step back and follow Zoltz's lead uh, and get down to sort of where the rubber meets the road here, because my role in this as the uh, AMS staff person is to um, take the lead in moving the policy and professional guidance statements that, that Doug Schuster uh, mentioned a little while ago to having the associated guidelines and requirements ready for authors, editors, and reviewers. And that's you know a lot easier said than done. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, educating and helping train staff update workflows to implement this poli the, these policies for AMS publications, um, not only um, staff, but also the volunteers who are involved in the peer review process as well. And one key question that gets to um, the core of how we're going to go about doing that is how deep into whom does the responsibility go for checking and verifying availability statements, for example? Um, is that part of the peer review process is, uh, and so is on the editors? They're already volunteering their time, so are reviewers. Uh, do we want to put more demands on their time, or is this? Uh, do we have the resources to make this more of a staff function? Um, and that's an open question right now, um, and we're we're in the process of dealing with that. Um, we also I also engage with the Publications Commission, which is the body at AMS that governs all of our journals, and publications, uh, Doug's board on data stewardship, um, as well as other boards such as. Uh, the Board for Best Practices that's part of the Commission on Professional Affairs. So there are a lot of 
various stakeholders that um, are important in, um, in this whole process. Um, as far as where we are specifically, um, the data policy and guidelines that are presently uh, online um, were updated um, not all that long ago. Um, and the, they're, given that they, we have a new software uh, policy that, that Doug mentioned before, and the link is there, we're now in the process of updating those guidelines to incorporate those best practices too. And I'm hoping by uh, the end of the summer, we'll have um, all that uh, in place. So uh, if you go to the next slide, um, and this is the last slide, um, this is how we get there and what is helping us in this way. Um, and a lot of these, you'll, you've heard these themes already, participation in other efforts, wider efforts in this area is very crucial. That's groups like COPDES, uh, Force 11 Task Force, and um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in a few of these and keeping abreast of what's, um, what are the latest developments is really important for a small independent society um, like us. So increased communication and coordination across publishers is really key, not only to progress in general, but even getting down to a, the specifics, minimizing researcher and author pushback. Um, this was already mentioned in, in the context of software and we'll, I'm sure we'll get some as well. But, um, you know, even tweaking our data, our approach to data requirements for, um, for authors uh, and publishers um, is, is uh, an important thing too. So, um, and development of common resources. And I think this is an area where we've made a lot of progress um, and we need to continue to make progress. Uh, and because one thing that, would, that is very useful not only for us, but I'm sure for um, your, the other societies too, is to have clear examples of data and software citations that cover as many different scenarios as possible. Now, it, it's impossible to, to cover every potential uh, situation, but you know, having these situation specific scenarios does help authors, you know, a good, section of our society um, is a private sector. And there are, there's proprietary data and software involved. There may be human research involved. That has its own restrictions. So having this being very transparent, so authors have a specific guide in those kinds of situations is important. It's also great to have new tools, uh, to develop new tools to assist authors in determining the what, where, and how of preserving data and software and making them readily accessible and usable. Um, and a, a key area that's become more and more important um, are these extremely large data sets and model data and output. Um, you know, satellite data sets, you know, uh, environmental data sets can be absolutely huge. What should a researcher be saving? What should they be making available? What guidance is there around this and model data output? So having tools like the rubric that's being developed by the model data RCN project um, to give authors specific guidance as to what types of model data output need to be saved um, is really, really key. And, um, and of course, having repositories, institutional repositories, disciplinary repositories, being readily identified that we know our uh, authors are using um, is really helpful too, because not everyone is going to be as familiar with that. So I guess, you know, with that, I'll, I'll stop and we can move on to the next presentation. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, I guess we'll pass on to Angie from the American Chemical Society. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Angie Hunter. I'm a Senior Data Integrity Manager at ACS Publications. Um, just to give a little background, I oversee um, teams of data analysts that review the data in a subset of journals um, to make sure that they're compliant, that they have the data needed for reproducibility. And I also um, work on data initiatives for ACS Publications. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some initiatives we launched last year and a pilot program that we have upcoming um, in 2022. 
Uh, just to get a little background, we realized a few years ago that ACS was kind of behind our competitors. Uh, we didn't have an overarching uh, data framework or a policy. All of our information about data uh, was within each journal guidelines. So if you were an author and you submitted to one journal, you go to another journal and maybe they had different guidelines. So we realized we needed to have something much more forward facing, easier to use, um, simplified language and consistent across the portfolio of journals. Um, so with that, um, we worked with um, a number of editors and outside experts to develop this overarching research data policy. This was launched on the Publishing Center just last year. Um, it provides best practices for data citation, data availability statements, and repositories. Um, we realized we could not even think about a data availability statement. In it, we talked in previous um, conversations with publishers, we realized we really couldn't launch a data availability statement until we had this policy in place. So we wanted to take those necessary steps. Um, we also realized that we didn't have a seat at the table in all these conversations that are going on like today uh, about what other uh, organizations are doing. And so with that, we became an organizational member of the Research Data Alliance. We endorsed top guidelines, um, Force 11, STM, Brussels Declaration. And again, with the data policy, we really want to change that culture of sharing data and making it included as part of the publication um, and really educate authors on their data expectations um, for ACS publications. And again, I think that's the recurring theme I've heard throughout today. Educating authors is really the key to uh, most of this. Um, and again, we realize when data is available, there are so many benefits like we talked to uh, earlier. Uh, it just it makes the research appear to be more trustworthy if you have your data published alongside of it. And there's this increased pressure from funders um, that this is a valuable research output. And so we need to make sure that we have a home for that data or a way so authors understand those requirements. We also launched the ACS uh, data guidelines page. This is also on the publishing center. So separate from the policy, which talks about data availability statements, the data guidelines wanted to look at um, subfield of data guidelines. So for example, organic chemistry. The, in our current standards before we launched this, you may have had different guidelines at each individual journal. So we had one have one subset of organic journals that would work for the for all journals that had organic data. And again, computational machine learning, they had their own area and biological. The goal, ultimate goal would be to take that information out of each individual guideline and point all authors directly to one set of guidelines that would work for all journals. So we did launch these, uh, the three guidelines I talked about in October. Um, and coming soon in 2022, we're working with um, for nanoscience, material science, and energy. And again, all of this, um, all these guidelines were reviewed by our editors, and they were always excited that they realized that this was a problem in their own community, that there wasn't a consensus in standards. So they were excited that this was really the direction that ACS should be going. Um, and again, excited to have these launched next year. Take the next slide, please. And so I'm just gonna quickly show, um, I know there's a lot of text on this, but just some screenshots of what these uh, pages look like. On the left is the ACS research data policy. Again, we want a very simple language anywhere that we could have um, clickable links so authors could understand. We also have data availability statements that can be grab and go, so authors can put those in there. Um, I think we have five. And we have uh, a number of levels of uh, data policy. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. And on the right, we have the data guidelines. Again, in the publishing center, you can expand each section and see those guidelines um, for each of those subsets of disciplines. And then next slide, please. So if we look in, and again, I know it's very small text, on the left-hand side, um, we offered four levels of flexibility um, for the data policy, levels one through four. Currently at level one, um, it's encouraging data sharing. So every journal at ACS uh, meets this data standard. So every journal is at level one. To get to level two, um, you need to ha have a data availability statement required. And so this is what we're going to be working on in 2022. We do have a pilot. Um, we're aiming at a few journals, a subset of journals, where this will be required for publication. Um, this project is really a submission to production project. You need to think about all the ways that we need to educate authors, whether there's frequently asked questions, examples of what it should look like in the paper, um, 
how we deal with it at the journal if an author isn't compliant or doesn't have it. Again, we really want to work on that education piece of authors, knowing that this is also required. It always does take time. And then we've also had to um, uh, upgrade some of our production systems to handle these data availability statements. So uh, again, um, it's it's a it's an all hands project, but so far uh, going well. And I think we should be having a data availability statement in a few journals um, later on this year. When we look to level three, um, we do have some journals that require certain types of data, for example, SIF data at CCDC, but they don't have a data availability statement, and maybe it's not capturing all the data that's there. So they're not at level three yet. Uh, again, we'd love to go there, and who knows, maybe in five years we'll, we'll be at that place. And then finally, level four is that peer review of data, which is, as Jake mentioned, is much more difficult. How do you ensure that the data has been peer reviewed? So uh, taking this one step at a time, we're at level one, hoping to get a subset of journals at level two, and then learn from this pilot. So eventually launch throughout the portfolio. Um, and I'll pause there. And so we can transition to the next speaker. Thank you. Perfect. And thank you very much, Angie. Um, we're going to move to Heather Carlo from the Ecological Science of America talking about their policy statements and how they've dealt with um, data and other pieces. Go ahead, Heather. Hi there, and thanks everyone for attending. I'm Heather Carlo, and I'm a production editor with ESA, and I provide support to authors and coordinate with our publishing partner, Wiley. I've been with ESA since 1999 and witnessed the evolution of our data and code policies during that time. And I'd like to briefly discuss our policy implementation and our guideline history. During this time, we've verified literally thousands of data and code links before releasing papers to the publisher. And our current policy and instructions are the product of many individuals working to convey the past lessons and also current practices. ESA has long expected our authors to make all the underlying data available. But in 2011, we implemented our first formal data requirement policy at our journal Ecological Monographs. In 2012, ecology began requiring novel code. And in 2014, ecological applications joined ecological monographs in requiring data. As been, has been touched on here, this inconsistency across our journal titles was difficult on everyone involved, authors, reviewers, editors, staff. And in February 2021, we launched a unified open research policy across the ESA family of journals. If you'd like to move to the next slide, please. So our open research guidelines have expanded considerably over the years, and they originally consisted of just those two short paragraphs on the left with four example repositories named. Today's instructions span multiple pages, and I'll drop a link into the chat. And each of those tabs gives even more detail. Um, we've been growing them to address general principles and each of the complex scenarios we've encountered during 11 years of handling papers under these policies. And our guidelines continue to evolve as we receive feedback from our community and as new best practices are established. I have one last slide, please. The ESA journals publish all subdisciplines within the ecological sciences. In the last several years alone, this has resulted in open research statements in our journals that link to more than 170 data and code hosting platforms. There's just a small sample of those partnerships on the left there where we tag repositories in the issue release notices and try to have that partnership going and, and link to the open data every time we post a new paper as well. We recognize, as has been mentioned earlier today, that there's many differences among the repositories and their curation of materials. And we should also anticipate that the general technology, the hosting platforms and presentation practices will continue to evolve. Data and code policies must be adaptive to that change. And ESA has formed strong partnerships since implementing our policies by creating networks but there's still work to be done to streamline and simplify the process, establish common guidelines across hosting platforms and societies, and to simplify the author experience, leading to stronger in data and code integrity in the science published by all society journals. And congratulations are due to everyone who has helped us come so far in these 11 years, and we look forward to the next steps. And with that, I'll pass this back to Jolt for any questions for our panel. Perfect, thanks, Heather. 
And uh, thank you again, Jake, Michael, Angie, and Heather for a lot of very useful information for the group. Um, I saw a number of questions floating through, so I'll just throw it to you and then we can uh, obviously have more discussion and, and, and other ideas floating across. Um, I saw something about data sharing. Does it apply to summary data or multi-source raw data? Do any one of you want to take that question in terms of what does data sharing mean or how do you deal with that? Um, you could jump at the same time. I don't <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the million dollar question, right? You know, and, and I think that there there isn't an across the board answer. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the way that we come at that question is that, you know, people come and say, we can't reproduce the paper with what they put in the repository, we need more. And then you kind of know for next time. I, I mean, as I said, you know, I, I think that is something that, um, we really need to work on uh, on a sort of discipline by discipline basis that that's sort of my sense and and it's an area where some of the disciplinary societies can can really add some value at coming up with standards for that exact question and and not only standards but also tools that um, are readily available absolutely uh, similar to, to you know what was highlighted in the chat just a few minutes ago with regard to big data and model data output. Right, right, no, that makes sense. Um, any other thoughts on that, Angie? Yeah, I, I think uh, the data sets are really evolving. I mean, what was acceptable 10 years ago is not necessarily acceptable now. Maybe we want more. So I just think um, it, it is so, so varied. Um, that I'm looking to see where the future is gonna be in the next five years, right? So, so where we were at 10 years ago, we are at a much better place, but that means we should still be doing more. What is the next step? So the next step is having that data somewhere in a repository, openly accessible. So if somebody wants to reproduce the data, they're able to compare their results. I think that's, that's the ultimate goal. But again, it's so varied by each individual type of data. Right. Is that possible? So let me, I'm going to shift it a little bit now to this idea of resourcing. So as I heard your presentations, um, you know, Angie, you're, you're talking about a large group of people, larger group of people being involved. Heather has a small number of people involved. Jake has, you know, Mike, Michael has, you know, a, a, a subset of individuals and Jake has more. So how do we deal with the resourcing of this? Because not every society is exactly the same size, right? We have different amount of resources, yet the the demands of, of all of this are increasing. So you have thoughts on what do we do about this? Because it's not going to get easier. It's, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're fortunate at a few of the journals at ACS that we do have data analysts that review that technical information, but it's not throughout the portfolio. Um, it is really resource intensive and it does take time to review this data. It does, I think, take that burden a little bit off of editors and reviewers, although they should be also reviewing the data um, to make sure it's there and consistent. I, I don't know. I guess I don't really know how to answer that question, but it, other than it, 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 is, an, it, it is an issue that um, you do need to put resources towards this um, because I think it, it's a very valuable component of the, of the data alongside the publication. Yeah, and it's a very good point that you know, each individual society is going to have a different level of support that they can provide for this, which I think is why having sort of more community-wide resources to see what other publishers really are doing and how they're implementing this um, would really help um, you know, other societies move forward that aren't quite um, up to the same point. And I, I mean, I, I think that this is also, you know, quality control goes hand in hand with um, the sort of adherence and loyalty to particular subject specific repositories. So if you look at, um, you know, the crystallography repository, which, which great about that is that, you know, once all of the formats got standardized, then they could start doing automated quality checks, right? Like the check SIF or the validation report for, for protein structures. And so you're in a situation there where it gets straightforward for the repository rather than the journal to, to be helping to, to assure quality control. But, you know, 
we're unfortunately a long way from that with uh, more generic types of data. And, and I think that's, you know, that's where working hand in hand, um, not only with, with the societies writ large, but with the repositories per se, which also sometimes have, have connections to the, the individual membership societies, I think is really important. That's a fantastic point, Jay, because, you know, this is a plug for Shelley's seminar that we literally just had, um, what, three weeks ago, where we brought institutions together across the board and exactly the same problem, you know, elevated up in terms of, you know, everybody needs to be involved in this and it needs to be coordination and there probably needs to be a significant collaboration and, and um or you know, organization to create something like you're talking about in crystallography or genomics, where where there are you know where there are systems and tools that deal with this. So it's it's an interesting point in all of this. Um, there's two other points that sort of came so, up. There's a this is a great time to go ahead and transition to our last part if you're if we're ready to go there. Thank you. For there the you call. go. Yeah, I'll let you go. All right. Um, so. Uh, I, I don't think that we can spotlight every single speaker, but if you can bring us all back up, um, Laura, that'd be great. We have a poll. So uh, everyone who's here, don't leave. Um, the What we'd like to do is get the energy of the room and you're, let's just all pretend we're together right now. Get the energy of the room to figure out if we all pull together as societies, which you can see how we're thinking that way. The collaborators are thinking that way. Um, but we could really use some help as to what you would like to, uh, what we should work on first. Um, and so I'm gonna, there's two things I want you to consider. I'm gonna pop up a poll right now um, and launch. I'm gonna hit the button that says launch. Okay, cross your fingers, everybody. Does every, can anybody see this poll? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, please answer, there are 10 questions. Um, and what do you think we should work on? You can, you can put as many clicks as you want there. Um, and if you don't see something you're interested in, there were a few things in the chat um, that were also uh, really important. Feel free to pop those in the chat and plus one across each other. Um, I'm just gonna let this here a moment. There's, um, because there are so many questions uh, and you're just now answering. All right, so take your time. I mean, don't take your time, but <laughs> if I keep reading. You'll see things from awareness to incentives. You'll think, see things having to do with the third panel on publishing. Um, so uh, we'll give you all, let's give you maybe two or three minutes to read through it all. Great. Great. So if some folks are like, okay, what am I answer, What am I responding for? Does it matter to me? The, the context here is if you were gonna ask a team of societies to come together and, um, uh, and, and come up with something common, what would that be? Like if, if all of these collaborators came together and handed to their membership in mass a thing, what would that be? Ish. All right, we're getting about more than 50% participation. So please, please keep going. Great, 10 of you are abstaining. Does anyone, Leah doesn't see the poll. I, Leah, I'm not sure why you don't see the poll. Don't worry, I will, uh, we, can, we can share the results. Okay, so maybe some of you can't see the poll. All right, I will go ahead and end it then. All right, here we go. Is everybody seeing the poll results? And oddly, I can just see Heather. I don't know why I can just see Heather. Hi, Heather. <laughs> Not seeing the, oh, share results. There's a button, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now you're seeing? Heather, you have to nod your head because you're the only person I can see. Okay, uh, why is it the only, maybe, can I do something about that? Uh, nope, I have no idea. Okay, someone else has to know. Charlie, in the top right corner of your screen, you should be able to change the view. 
Oh, is it, is it just me? Okay, now I can see gallery. Okay, Heather, you were just spotlighted for me personally. How nice. So we have, um, oh gosh, some things are popping up as being very strong. So let me start from the top. Um, awareness, of course, for sharing. Great, that makes sense. Education is coming in very strong with 53%. That's good. Um, I'm going to hop down a little bit. Uh, education. Education is winning here. Uh, having journals require data and software citation. That one is also very high. Leading by example, implementing incentives. Very nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, but still strong on all of the other elements. Okay. All right. Great. So this is really helpful. Um, in the chat, how many voted? We had 59 people voting. We had 59. And when I looked, there were 69 participants. So it was, we were just short 10 folks and Leah clearly didn't get the poll. So <laughs> we'll have to have Leah join in, a, uh, uh, joined in an ad. And I think we might put the poll out on Twitter and see what comes back, uh, see what comes back. Uh, I will go ahead and stop sharing the poll. Um, close that out. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and I know there were a bunch of really interesting um, uh, uh, ideas coming in on chat that we could have added to the poll as well. Um, so let's start with education. I think that had the highest number. Um, would would anyone like to talk about the kind of education that maybe you're offering or you would like to see? Uh, go ahead and put your hand up. Go up to the top here and take a look. Um, if anybody would like to ex expound on that for a moment, we have eight minutes left, which is, we can do an awful lot. We don't, I don't think we can solve world peace, but we can certainly do an awful lot. Okay, the large, the folks that are dealing with large data are going back and forth. That's fantastic. Keep going because that's definitely a, a, a theme. Fair wizard being a job title. Nice. Uh, that's possible. Uh, we could look to our European Commission friends because they are working very hard on a tool called Fuji um, that is measuring fair uh, in, a, in a machine automated way. Um, and that's continuing to improve. There was one person who was talking about the vocabulary and if there was uh, vocabularies and taxonomies were ready to be fair, the answer there is a very firm no, uh, but there are teams that are working on that. Some areas are better than others. Um, yep, Alicia, thanks for that. Um, uh, what it means to have standards what it, uh, around physical samples, around the different discipline types of data. Um, John, you're happy to put the post in the citation to your paper. That would be fantastic. Thank you. That'd be great. We can share that out in the notes. Uh, Heather, Heather, do you want to jump in and talk? I can, I can mention, yes, the, um, in those thousands of data sets we've seen, uh, people don't seem to put any thought into what they should name a data set. Um, and they'll name it the exact same thing as their manuscript. They'll publish on Zenodo using their user profile, which is their very generic common login name they assign themselves instead of a, their true publishing identity. And that citation is then, you know, puppy lover or whatever else they've decided to, you know, decide that they are and identify themselves as online. And um, so speaking to some clarity on how do you name your data set how do you divide your files up and how do you make your citations all cohesive that way? I think would be very helpful for what we're seeing in practice among our authors. That, that's very practical and it's very very oriented on the, on the burden of the researcher. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. We could do that certainly. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of the things to be aware of is a lot of the automation that happens within publication production is they're trying to pull out the journal name from a citation. And if you put the journal name in the title of your data set, I have to tell you the probability of that being parsed correctly is so low. Um, it is a humongous problem. Uh, we don't have a we don't have a resolution to that. It you know maybe makes sense. You know this 
this data set is for such and such a paper and such and such a journal title is problematic. Um, but it also might be one of the most um, uh, clear titles. You know, so it, it's something that publishers are dealing with, trying to figure it out. Uh, I'm not saying to do it or not do it. I'm just saying it's problematic. <laughs> Uh, oh, there's a lot of great ideas coming in. I can't read them fast enough. So we have five minutes. Um, so, so going back to the three areas that each of our panel moderators, uh, and thank you, thank you so much to all of our collaborators, our panel moderators, uh, you know, starting with Yvette and Julianne and Zolt. Uh, you know, the, the ideas that are coming through are very exciting. Everyone really wants to work together. Um, they were, we were all leaning in on some of the conversations that we've had together um, and want to take more publicly. Um, if anyone is representing or, or, or could represent another society that um, would like to participate, do, do put, either send a note to me or put it in the chat that you'd like to be part of all of this, um, to come together as societies in order to uh, determine what it means to actually lean in and support each other across societies, both staff and volunteers. Uh, and also, um, if there are particular things that we can talk about broadly um, that apply across all of this, there are quite a number. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been digging in, um, in the, uh, the natural sciences, uh, so not just uh, AGU, but also broadly is when we start to talk about the type of information that's necessary for a particular type of researcher to trust, value um, a data set, uh, what does that look like? And when you, uh, sometimes the type of data has the same pattern to it. Sometimes when you're looking at field work, field studies, that data has a pattern. Or uh, when you're looking at um, a certain format that's coming from a certain instrument, that data has a pattern. And that instrument type might be shared across a number of disciplines. And having those cross-discipline conversations to at least have a common understanding, you might not land in the same kind of detail, but for us to be able to come across all of our societies to have a collaborative discussion would be incredibly exciting to do. So we're looking at what that would look like. Um, and if that makes sense to you, uh, please do um, uh, you know, express that uh, in a way that we know to pull you in on those emails and those invitations. Um, so we're coming up on two minutes. Um, does, uh, well, <laughs> Emily, yes, Emily, I know. Well up. I'll take that as a big step. Go team. Um, so uh, I don't think we can get started on a new discussion, uh, but I wonder, uh, Randy, I'm seeing that you're still on and Brooks is still on. Would you like to jump in and have uh, uh, one of those umbrella statements that, uh, that, that can happen at this moment? Um. Thanks, Kelly. So thanks, everyone. I'm trying to reflect not on just on this meeting, but everything that's led up to this. And I think, as several have commented, it's been a great learning, sharing, uh, also just a great collaboration uh, um, where societies have been brought together and others, stakeholders have been brought together that really haven't before. So um, I think, you know, we're ending on how we go forward and I suspect the the leadership group for this or I know the leadership group will get together and think about this so um, more um, more to come and thanks to everyone for all the energy on this, this is really uh, critical and I'm, I'm really charged by how much progress we're making as Jake said a lot of progress in three years um, at, at, uh, in some sense and a lot still to do but we're heading in the right direction so thank you so Laura, can you bring up our final slide? I do want to announce that we are um, designing a, another seminar series. Um, it's a little different. <laughs> it is a little different. So um, this work among societies, we do want to build on that and go forward. This, um, the, the elements around open science do go much more broad. So we are dedicated to working on these society goals, but I also want you to be aware that about uh, mid this year, 
uh, we will introduce and invite everyone who has been part of this work um, to participate in open science. We're calling it open science for all. Uh, I just think that's kind of a fun title. Uh, and we'll, we'll start to engage on what it means to work openly, how that affects researchers and your research teams, as well as your discipline, your institutions and beyond. So this will be a very broad conversation. Uh, we have yet to design it. If anyone wants to help design it, you're welcome to jump in. There will be a collaboration. We are not doing this by ourselves. Um, so I, I would love to invite anyone interested in um, all of these topics that we can bring them to our broad community as well. Um, and that puts us right at the top of the hour. And thank you, everyone. This has been an amazing seminar series. I'm just incredibly delighted with today and every single session over the last year. Thank you, Shelley, and thank everyone.